Okay, time to dig some volunteer potatoes. So these are potatoes that have just sprouted from probably a peeling that su survived the composting process. We didn't plant anything here. We, the only thing we planted in here on purpose is rhubarb. And so in this plot we've got volunteer tomatoes, which are fruiting nicely down there. We've got volunteer squashes, which I don't think are necessarily going to come to anything. And potatoes. And this plant's starting to look a little bit kind of straggly now. So we're going to dig it up and see what's underneath it. And I'll go in about here, I reckon. Okay, it might be fingers actually. Well, hmm. Not much attached to the plant, although there's some lovely little ones there. But. We're not done. Because... Basically free potatoes. Those won't be the only ones either. So just put those in there for now. And we'll have another little dig down here. Let's see what escaped. Oh look, there's another one. Let's see what might have escaped us on the first dig. Might be it actually. Oh no, there's another one. Nice. Another tiny one there. And another. And another. That might be it. Go too far this way, although I don't really think those volunteer squashes are going to do anything. So I'll just go into here as well. No, I reckon that's it. But here's what we got for literally zero effort. These are volunteer potatoes and quite lovely. That one there's got a little bit green on it, so might not bother with that one. But the rest of them are great. And they look like they might be King Edward actually because they've got a little bit of pink around the eyes. Good stuff. So on top of that we've got some broad beans to pick. We've got some other bits and pieces. Runner beans, so Jenny's picked some nice broad beans. We've got some runner beans to pick as well. While we're here I'll just show you these. These are potato fruits. So after the potato plant has flowered and produced fruits this is what you get and they look a lot like tomatoes but they're not tomatoes they're actually quite toxic now the leeks were growing have not done all that well I think that's probably a lot to do with the amount of moisture they've had and probably I've neglected watering them a couple of them have started bolting which means producing flower stems I'm gonna pull that one up and we'll eat it today so it's a tiny tiny leek more like a spring onion but we'll eat that today while we're here I will just show you some of my squashes. This is the children of the volunteer squash. These are the seeds that came with me from the old house. Every time I show these and talk about self-seeded or saved seeds from squashes I get people worried about something called bitter squash syndrome. Not a problem here, actually not a big problem at all unless you're growing edible varieties alongside non-edible varieties and they cross-pollinate. It's not just cross-pollination that causes it, it's cross-pollination with a bitter varieties such as a wild squash or one of those ornamental ones. This has had none of that so don't worry about bitter squash syndrome. It's, it's not just about cross-pollination, it's what it gets crossed with. But also there's a courgette here. I'm not actually going to pick that one today because we've got so many courgettes already indoors. It's Everything is courgettes now. This is the nature of growing courgettes. It's um, you wait and wait and wait and hope and hope and hope for your first courgette and then after you've had the first courgette everything is courgettes but that's fine I like courgettes and they're very good for you also tomatoes are plenty now so I'm gonna pick a few of these I've actually already picked most of the very ripe ones today but I'll pick a couple more so we got some chicken in the oven and we're gonna make something that's got most of the things from the garden now these broad beans some of these are getting a bit long in the tooth now and so they'll tend to be quite tough inside the pods so 
when they're very young, broad beans, you can just eat the whole thing. I mean, some people do eat the pods, but I'm going to pass on that because they're quite tannic. And for one reason or another, not a good idea for me to have too much tannin in my diet. Anyway, these beans tend to get a bit tough towards the end of the season. We've still got a couple more meals to pick out there of broad beans, but what they are good for at this stage. Well, a couple of things. You can put them in a stew and give them a good long cooking and the skins on the beans here will go nice and soft and perfectly edible. Or you can just steam them or boil them or whatever if you like to chew on bean skins. But I'm going to peel them because I'm going to put them in with the potatoes. I'm going to kind of cook the potatoes until they start to break up and then smash them up. And the beans will go in somewhere along the way. And we'll have smashed potatoes, not mashed potatoes, smashed potatoes with broad beans. I think maybe that leak in there as well. And peeling just is just as simple as cutting them in half lengthways like that and popping the little bean kernel out of the skin. And you can see that skin is, I don't know, it'd probably be all right, but I quite like them when they're peeled like this. So there we go, peeled broad beans. And those are all the shells. Those will go in the compost, together with the pods. This leak, too long to show in shot. Well, I think we're probably gonna be okay for soil inside of there because it was so slender and tall. Yeah, that bit's fine. So I'll just have the roots off there. And then this green bit, including the flower stalk, I don't see any reason why we can't use that as well. I'm just going to check in there. Yes, yeah, so you get a little bit of dirt in the top here. So I will just pull those apart and give those a wash. And then this is the flower stem. So this is like solid green onion or leek or whatever. So this is actually a kind of solid stalk. And again, every part of this is edible. including we are getting now to the little flower bud there. Oh, i just seen an earwig run across the counter. That must have come out of the beans. I'll rescue that and get it outside. That's what you get with pesticide-free veg. Haven't actually sprayed any pesticides at all on these veg. They've been really good this year. Let's just catch that earwig. That's a whopper. And we'll release that to the wild. There we go. That can now live its happy little earwig life on our lawn. Right, so that's gonna need a tiny little bit of frying or something like that in butter. And then I've got the potatoes to get going. Potatoes have mostly washed up rather nice. Some very lovely little specimens in there. Some of them have got a little bit of warty scabs on them, a little bit of wartiness on them. I'm sure that's perfectly edible, but for aesthetic reasons, I'm just going to scrape that off. Just surface blemishes. Either caused by something like a slug's had a little nibble and then it's healed over, or it might even just be that they've this potato was growing up against a rock and it got a little bit of scratch. So I'm just, just going to scrape off that. Like I say, mostly aesthetics, really, because there's nothing inedible there. Gosh, the potatoes are so firm when you get them from the garden. They are so different to the potatoes you get in the shops. And it comes through in both the flavour and the texture of these potatoes. You would think that kind of toughness like that is, would not be a an attribute you desire, but... It does make a difference. Yeah, that potato's got a bit of green on it. I'm not gonna chance it. That can go in the compost, and who knows, it might even survive the composting process and be next year's volunteer potato. So these, I don't wanna cook them too long. So I'll cut these into smallish dice. Most of the reason, see, sometimes you do get a little blemish in a potato that looks like a little surface blemish and it's not. It's the entry point for where a slug 
or a woodlouse burrowed its way right inside the potato. So, you know, cutting them up would reveal that anyway. And also, wood license slugs are technically edible. So, you know, probably more so than the pesticides that I might be offered to control them. Right, potatoes are on. Leeks are gonna get a very gentle fry in just a huge piece of butter. That butter's gonna end up in the potatoes. And as I say, I've also got tomatoes. I'll have some of those on the plate as well. Those leeks have had no more than about two minutes frying in that butter, and that's enough. So I'm gonna reserve those in a small dish, and we'll use the pan for the courgettes. Because I did mention we've got courgettes, right? More like more jets. And I just like to trim away that little bit in the middle there, that little pithy seedy bit that lives in the middle of the courgette there, by quartering it first. And then you can just run the knife down there. It's quite easy to control the knife when it's going down. So if it feels like it's cutting too deep, you just lean it back. If it feels like it's going too shallow, you just tilt it that way. And anyway, but you can scrape it out with a spoon. But these bits I don't like so much anyway, they kind of go mushy. And I'll just cut those into little chunks like that. And then those can go into the pan that the leeks came out of. Jenny's prepared the runner beans. These courgettes are just gonna have a little bit of thyme from the herb garden. So these courgettes are already picking up the flavour of the leek from the pan that was already left in there, but also got some garlic chives, which I'll just snip in there. I think we're going to find these potatoes are, yeah, close to done now. So, broad beans go in with them. And I've got a couple of nice little sprigs of parsley, also from the herb garden. wasp in here. Go away. Sorry for the interlude, there was a wasp. I have to give it the old glass and postcard. Right, and that parsley is going to actually go in with the leeks there because that's going to go into the potatoes when they're cooked, which I think is about now. Potatoes are cooked now and those broad beans, yeah, tender, they're just falling apart. Look at that. So that all gets drained. In with the leek and parsley and a load of butter. I think maybe not enough butter, so I'll have a bit more. Runner beans are done, they're just nice and bright green, so again we'll drain those. The courgettes are great, they've just got a little bit of toasting on them, which is going to give them a bit of flavour. Nice. So now that butter's starting to melt, the potatoes, I'm just going to give them a shake. Which will distribute all of those flavours, but also just break the potatoes up a tiny bit. There we go. So this is everything homegrown although accidentally homegrown potatoes. Now it's going to be quite a green plate, but why don't we just call that a theme? Some of the courgettes, the green beans, everything is green at the moment. And then a nice crispy roast chicken thigh. I'm going to sit that right there so that some of the juices go onto the courgettes and everything else. If I thought more about this, I might have put that on top of the potatoes, but I didn't. So here we are. That's all kind of green stuff, isn't it? So, just a few homegrown tomatoes. Right there, like that. Maybe one bigger one, Tigerella. Okay, well, everything except the chicken and the butter on this plate came from the garden. I can't wait to taste these potatoes, actually. Volunteer potatoes and broad beans. They're so good. Mm. It's time for the comment positivity section, and this is where I'm just gonna pick out a handful of comments that either made me smile or perhaps asked an interesting question or just felt uplifting. So most of these relate to the glowworm video. But anyway, before we get to that, a little bit of weird silly wordplay from one courgette to more jet, it's time to explore jet new recipes. I do like a bit of silly wordplay. So uh, we may not have seen your smile, but we could definitely hear it. Thank you for sharing your glowworm sightings. Even on screen, there was something magical about it. Um, there really was, and I, I hope my excitement came across in that video because 
There was such a build up to that. I haven't seen glowworms for years and years, decades even. And then I saw one in April, I saw the glowworm larva in April, and then saw a lot more in May. And then we had to wait until July, sort of middle of July. And finally, we got to see glowworms in the dark on a dark lane. It was like a kid waiting for Christmas, really. So uh, there was just this long, long wait, and then all of a sudden, the reward. And it was just amazing. So yeah, another one. Okay, I wasn't quite as prepared as I thought when it came to you finally spotting glowworm activity. I think I was almost as excited for you as you were about seeing them. I too had a goofy smile on my face because it was so obvious how happy you were. Congrats, and may this be the start of many more nights of glowworm mating rituals in the future. Definitely something that I'm gonna get out and look at again. I don't know if I'm ever gonna get better footage than that because I, I think you probably need professional camera equipment and probably some proper lights. And I don't wanna haul out a load of lights out there and potentially disturb the mating of these precious animals. Anyway, I really like the being happy on purpose philosophy. Taking the time to enjoy the things we like and savour the moments, any time I find an exceptionally large onion or girthy carrot nowadays, it makes me happy. Not because I find them particularly funny, but because it reminds me that you like them and that happiness can come from all sorts of things. And that's good, isn't it? Happiness is infectious. So why don't we do more of it? Another one, I love your take on slowing down just to enjoy things. I never understood why others find it odd or childish to take delight in something simple. For example... I really do love to see birds of any kind. They're truly a wonder to behold, but many others see them as mundane and don't understand why I'd bother to stop and watch a robin or raven going about their day. I mean, their wings and body language are also fascinating. How can I not? I think that's a really good point. We spend, when you're a kid, very often adults are telling you to grow up. There's this kind of notion that there's the virtue attached to being mature and acting in a mature fashion. And certainly there are times when you do need to be sensible and so on. Job interviews, for example. I think maybe we lose something along the way. Why is it bad to be childish? Why is it bad to just be enjoying something that's really silly? I don't think it is. But I think sometimes we can kid ourselves that it is. I think sometimes we can kind of get into the habit of trying to be sensible and mature and take the grown-up stance and like I say, sometimes that's necessary. I think a lot of the time it isn't. And I think a lot of the time we'd be having a better day if we could just childishly or innocently enjoy the things that are around us. Certainly I think I'm finding it works for me. And here's a case in point. This is a little conversation about moss. Predilections and contemplations. Moss. I love moss. When I walk around the grounds, I will stop in my tracks to bend down and stare at the world of moss. The little forest, the little garden, the little worlds. The different mosses with their minuscule blooms or bitty trees or tiny fields of verdant softness. I will spend quite a bit of time staring at moss. It makes me unreasonably happy. It stills my mind. Perhaps that's the purpose of such large onion, odd pumpkin, sumptuous moss fascinations. A few people responded to this. I used to annoy my mum by trying to set up moss gardens in fish tanks on my bedroom windowsill. Still love a nice green round hummock. And yeah, I think I've said this probably a dozen times. I think it's really important to find out what makes you happy and then go and do it on purpose. Then one, regarding the sea glass segment, it was still very worthwhile for the sorting because it was satisfying to see. Yeah, so I wasted about an hour, I think, sorting out the sea glass into different colours and then I decided I didn't want it in different colours in the jars. But it was satisfying to sort it out, satisfying to just to sit there and contemplate sea glass. But also... There was a bit of interesting insight. It was it was interesting to see the ratios of the different colours and to think about what the reasons for that might be. And back on the glowworms, fittingly the automatic captions think there's applause during some of the glowworm section. I assume that must be when I was crunching on gravel or something. Maybe the auto captions thought that that was applause sound. The auto captions do some strange things at times actually. I've noticed sometimes when there's music on, it just says foreign. Really weird, but actually the auto captions thing on YouTube is really quite amazing in that it usually works. Uh, quest oh, thing about beaches now. When you show views of beaches, it always flips me out because I live in a coastal Australian city and our beaches are completely different. They're firstly very sandy and secondly surrounded by dunes when they haven't been massacred by development. So your beaches are absolutely different to ours. Such an interesting view. It is interesting. I get a lot of comments about our beaches and about how the beaches in the UK must be different to 
the ones in the rest of the world. You might be seeing a kind of biased sample because I don't typically go to sandy beaches, not very often. It's not that I don't like sand, I'm, you know, I'm not a monster, but it's just that I do like rocky beaches. I do like stony, shingly beaches. But the UK, probably much like the rest of the world, does have actually quite a wide variety of different beaches. For example, uh, in along the south coast of England, they're typically stony, flints and so on, although there are some nice sandy beaches around the south of England. Bournemouth, for example, Weymouth, which we, I think we're going to see in this video here, are sandy beaches. Uh, most of the beaches along the south coast are kind of shingly. When you get down into the west country, they start to be rocky. And so around Lyme Regis, they start to be kind of cobbly. And you go further west and you've got actual craggy rocks jutting out crops of rocks and rocks that go straight down into the sea. So once you get down into Cornwall, you've got really rocky beaches, often with sandy coves in the middle of them. Up on the east and west coasts, you've got a lot of broad sandy beaches. Morecambe Bay on the west coast, for example, is a great big, broad, flat, sandy beach. And of course, on the east coast, East Anglia has got a lot of really sandy beaches. When you get further north to the north of England and Scotland, it starts to get rocky again, and so a lot of a lot of Scottish beaches are very very craggy and rocky. Again, often with really pretty sandy coves. So there's quite a lot of variety in the beaches in the UK. You're typically only seeing the ones that I go to, which obviously will tend to be the ones that are more local rather than less. I suspect it's also true that wherever you are, if you're looking at the beaches around me and thinking those are different to the beaches where I live, it might be that you're not aware of all of the different beaches your country has. So there might actually be more of a variety of beaches near you than you realise. And finally, I owe you an apology. I commented to my wife that your warnings about potential cliff falls and danger people put themselves in was exaggerated. The recent incident of a cliff fall in Dorset which almost caused injury or worse to doubters like me has certainly chastened me. I hope it does others too. So this is about the cliff fall at West Bay. So I'm not going to say, hey look I was right although I was right, but even a stop clock tells the right time twice a day. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the fact that I predicted that incident because these cliffs are dangerous, they fall down all the time. The timing is particularly interesting on this. About a week before that incident, I was talking about how precipitous those cliffs are at West Bay and how I would never sit down underneath those cliffs and how it was dangerous to do so. About a week later, some people were ogling at a cliff fall and it nearly fell on them. I think we should probably just look at that video because there's a couple of interesting things about it. One is that they are alive because they were standing up and were able to run away. If they'd been sitting down having a picnic at the bottom of that cliff, they'd be gone. But the other thing is that they were standing in front of that cliff fall before it happened and the camera was already rolling, which implies to me that they were standing in the danger zone, aware that there was a danger, and they were ogling at the danger instead of running away from it. So, you know, I mean... Of course I'm happy that they got out alive, but I think there are a couple of lessons in that. One is that, yeah, it's just not a safe place to picnic. It's certainly not safe to climb on those cliffs. But yeah, the big one for me is that when you start to see cliffs fall, don't stand and get your camera out and start filming. Turn and run. So that's about it for now. Let's get on with the rest of the video. Today we thought we'd have a look at Ringstead Bay. So Ringstead Bay is just the other side of Osmington from Weymouth. So east of Weymouth. So quite a steep and rough concrete track to walk down. fun coming back up.
And that's where we come from, that's the car up there. <laughs> Came all the way down the hill here. And we're still not down at the water level yet. down that way. I think it might be down this way. There we go. Help is not coming. So we've got Kimmeridge clay here and then that's a layer of iron ore there. Going all the way through. So there we go, that's a chunk of iron ore. Gosh, it's quite heavy. And then a vein of probably calcite right there. See some sparkly crystals in there. So seeing little bits and pieces of fossil shells here. And I imagine there might be something quite get to know. There might be something quite interesting in Will you be quiet? It's possible there could be something interesting inside that nodule. So evidence here of a military history. That's an old tank trap on its side now. Here's a plant we haven't spoken about before actually. This is related to goosefoot. This is salt bush. And it's basically a marine goosefoot. And yeah, these leaves are edible. Very much like spinach or sea beet, to which it's related. Down there, I can see the remains of a cast concrete pillbox, very similar to the one we saw at Kimmeridge. I'm not going to go all the way down there because it's further than we're going. Let's find you a rock to look, dig up then. Here's one. Here we go. Ready, steady, go. You've already dug it out. It's here. It's here. It's right there.
So there we go, that was Ringstead Bay on a very breezy Sunday afternoon in July. Okay, so we're down here and we've got to get back up to there where the car is, right on the top of that hill. Oh boy. Do you know it's funny because on the way down here I was looking at this concrete road track and thinking it has a bit of a World War II military access road look to it. I had no reason to suspect it was until we saw the radar station down there. But now, I think it's most likely this road was created as an access road for that radar station. Probably just a farm track here before that. Today we are at Abbotsbury. This is Abbey Farm. And we're going for a wander up to St Catherine's Chapel which is, I think, over there somewhere. Yeah, pretty sure it's this way. We just had brunch in Cherries. It was really good. I had a McCherries McMuffin, not affiliated. And that is how you do a breakfast muffin. Maybe it's not this way. That's the place we're going to, up there. We just gotta figure out where the footpath is, but uh, there's an app for that. downhill to go uphill mm. so yeah chapel okay. and village via rope walk oh. <laughs> okay well this is interesting I have not I don't remember the last time I saw a stone style how about that and we have to uh, traverse a bit of a mire here I think we can get up around this yeah an old tree. It's a plane tree. Yeah, I don't think you can quite get the scale of this in the video. So, Jenny, do you want to just go and stand over there on the roots? And I'll, we'll get a better idea of just how big this tree is. That's a whopper. Nice little brook here. Watercress, I think. Well, we may encounter cows at some point today. 
can see hoof prints there, or footprints from cows, coming down to drink. And uh, yeah, that's a cow thing. Right, well we want to go up there, but I'm not sure that directly up the hill is the right way. So I think we're going to go this way, and then double back. If my experience from that other hill we've climbed, which the name of which escapes me for the moment, going straight to the peak from the gate via the most obvious route is not the best route. Well, I'm going to stop and look at this thistle. How about that? Quite the thistle. <clears throat> now this is called rope walk and normally a rope walk would be a long straight path where ropes are made you find them quite often in coastal towns I suppose that could be we're kind of coastal here so yeah maybe this is where they laid ropes out to make them you need a long long space to twist the ropes so maybe that's why this is called rope walk maybe it was a rope walk lovely view from up here so that's Abbey Barn over there and Abbey Farm and that's the village of Abbotsbury over there and we're going up the hill Tom Scott. It's not, it's just someone who looks like Tom Scott and dresses like Tom Scott. Uh, I believe that is what they call scenic. Okay, well around this corner we're going to be able to see whether we've got to go down another hill to go up another hill. No, it looks like kind of level-ish. Over there, you can see the back of Chesil Beach and the Fleet Lagoon. We're quite close to the Abbotsbury Swannery. It's somewhere down there. But that's Chesil Beach over there. All along here, all these little holes, solitary mining bees. I did see one fly, but you can never get close to them. No. Up the hill now to St. Catherine's Chapel. What a place. What a landscape. Getting closer now. Fake Tom Scott has already gone inside. Well, that is quite the hill. Yeah, we are quite the way up. Let's go and have a look. Kissing gate. Ooh. No 
I don't think we're going to see very much inside. I think it's empty. But we'll find out. It's kind of more or less a preserved ruin, I think. Let's have a wander around the outside first. See the view, and then we'll go inside. blowy today That's quite nice, even though it's not a church as such. There are little notes of dedication and memory that people have left here to remember loved ones. I assume this would be the spiral staircase up to the tower, but it's locked, we can't go up there. Here we go, St. Catherine's Chapel. Amazing echo in here. We'll do a full circuit. I think this must be where Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens is, down here in this little protected dell. Oh boy, it's windy. Looks like you can get to a little bit of a headland over here. Shall we have a look at that? So yeah, you can see Chesil Beach stretching along there, all the way to the Isle of Portland, which you can just see through the mist. Oh gosh, it's so windy up here. myself here and see if we can see it coming out. There it goes. It went back in because it thinks I'm a it thinks I'm a bird. It thinks my camera is a bird. So that's why they're really difficult to photograph. It's just a wasp, isn't it? I don't know. 
It's not your regular wasp. This might be the things we're seeing burrowing here. They may be a solitary wasp of some sort. definitely a wasp. So back down the rope walk and back the way we came I think just for fun we'll measure the circumference of that big plane tree because I'm really not sure it came across on camera exactly how big that thing is. Now that's interesting because I don't think that is the natural course of this stream because it's not the lowest bit of terrain in the area so I think this stream has been diverted And it should be down there by rights. Water usually finds the lowest spot. So yeah, plane tree for sure. That's the plane, that's the fruits there. Those are the ones that crumble apart into basically itching powder when they're ripe. But we're gonna get down there and measure the circumference of that tree. Three hugs. And it was, what was the dot, was that one? There, yeah. no, there. The, Right. There? There. Yeah, that's yeah, it. There. Okay. So three hugs plus one arm to the middle of the chest. Okay, well back over the stone stile. And back up to the village for a little wander around. This plant here, well, all these plants here, this is the giant bugloss, quite commonly found in coastal places. The bees absolutely love this plant. I did think about growing some in the garden, but it's a bit of a commitment, isn't it? Huge great And you can tell we're in a sheltered coastal little microclimate. That's a date palm. And this is Abbotsbury. Strangways Hall. Well, here's something of a rarity. A telephone box that's still a telephone box. A lot of these telephone kiosks have either been taken away or a lot of villages keep them and convert them into little kind of uh, book swap or seed swap or toy swap sheds. But there's one that's still a phone box. That was Abbotsbury and St. Catherine's Chapel. So this little plot here is where I planted the yard long beans and they didn't do very well. There might be a couple of reasons for that. One person did say that the beans prefer acid soil. But here's something I noticed all by myself. Is this, this plot is just one massive ant's nest. So, and it's that time where all of the allates, these are the future queens and those are the 
very short-lived future kings, if that's what the right term is. The males, anyway, the smaller flying males, larger flying females, are all off. So I think that, together with possibly the alkalinity of the soil, is why these beans didn't come to anything. Indeed it is flying ant day today. These are, this is another nest down by the garage, going crazy. There's another one here. So here's the question, how are these ants coordinating all these flights? These are different nests we've looked at, so three or four different nests and they're coordinating their flight. How are they doing that? And largely it's to do with weather conditions. They're more or less ready to go, but they've waited until the humidity is high. Often this sort of swarming of the adult females, the future queens, is an, in, is an indicator that rain, often even thunderstorms, are on their way. Because the ants have waited until the conditions are right. The high humidity helps them to coordinate their mating flights, which means that you get ants from different nests will mate with each other to keep the genetics strong so that's an advantage and it's something that they will tend to do because it's worth doing but also once these females have mated they need to burrow into the ground and it will help them to do that if the soil is moist so that's part of the reason for them coordinating their mating flights by humidity predicting rain here's today's insect friend this is a jersey tiger moth which has got itself stuck in my greenhouse. So I will gently try to help it find its way out before it gets stuck in a spider web. It's rather difficult to help these guys sometimes because they obviously don't know the difference between me and a predator. So yeah, there we go, Jersey tiger moss, today's insect friend. So today we're going to go in search of a different kind of wildlife friend behind the scary door. This is the door we have replaced, and there just happened to be some uh, frogs have fallen down the back here, and there's no way for them to get out. They fall in off the lawn, off the upstairs lawn, down into here. They used to be able to get out through a hole in this door because there was just a gaping hole in the wood. They can't get out anymore. So every now and again, I will have to come in here and go on frog patrol. They will reveal themselves as they walk along here because they jump. Let's see if we can find one. Make sure I'm not going to tread on one. Oh, there's one. There it goes. Now they won't starve to death down here because there's plenty for them to eat. There's loads of wood lice and all sorts of things like that. And it's damp down here as well, so they won't die of exposure. But there's no way for them to get out. I think eventually I will build some kind of frog ladder at this end so they can get themselves out, but we haven't got around to doing that yet. So I've got to catch them by hand, for which I will have to put the camera off. Well, Michael, Neil, frogs, something. I haven't managed to catch even one. It's not actually all that easy for me to bend over here because I can't actually turn to face front. It's so narrow, it's not wide enough for my hips. So <laughs> I can't actually turn and bend over. And so the frogs have continued to elude me. I hope I haven't chased them out this door into the utility room. We'll soon, no, oh, there's one. Go on. Aha. Right, well, we've got one. I shall close that door now. And then this little frog, common frog, I'll put it just in this, we've got a little water feature just here. It can stay there until it decides to go somewhere else. It's, we're, we're forecast for rain this evening, so there we go. It can hang out there. Why don't you go down there, all you mates? Go on, in the water. That's it. So he can hang out there in the water and stay cool. 
until this evening it's going to pour with rain and he'll go off wherever he wants to go possibly around the corner and back down the slot i am again today at west bay last time i was here some people wondered what this word say so let's read it so it says full as earth faulted and slipped chapter by stratum cliff tells a story that is where we took you on that bit setting for stone and thought net and rope boat and home silted inlet rising striated sandstone at whose foot the sea endlessly frets so I think it's a poem about the cliffs Doing a little bit of decorating here at Shrimp Cottage and one of the internal doors, the lock was faulty on it. This is, it's just an internal door lock, so it's a, a cloakroom or toilet where there is a lock. But yeah, this sprung catch here, or well, the spring's dead, the whole thing's a bit iffy. Probably could take that apart and try and repair it maybe put a new spring in. It might be the springs just come unclipped from something, but it's not that difficult to just replace that like for like. So just took that along to B&Q and matched it up with a lock that's an exact replacement for it. So that will just drop in. The handles were a bit more of a problem. This is one of the old handles and it's obviously quite worn. This is a die-cast zinc, and it looks like it's been copper-plated. I imagine that might have been brass plating, actually, and maybe the zinc in the brass has just eroded away, leaving the copper. But it's very worn and very old-looking. Seen better days. So the problem is we looked at all the handles in B&Q, and there was quite a big range of handles, and they were either rather shiny brass or polished stainless steel, or brushed stainless steel. None of them really appealed to us very much. I quite like the design of this handle, and so what I'm gonna try and do is restore this. Jenny's already had a go at cleaning one of them up, so this is the other one from the other side of the door. And yeah, you can see there is copper there. It's copper on top of, I don't think that's solid copper, I think that is zinc. It's copper plated, but it's quite pitted. And obviously the handle definitely is die-cast zinc and it's lost all of its plating there. So anyway, I'm going to try rubbing these back. I've got some fine steel wool. I'm going to see if I can rub this back and get rid of all the pitting and get back to a smooth surface. Degrease it and have a go at replating it with copper. I've got some copper sulphate so we can just do that. So some fine steel wool. Now this could be destructive so we are running the risk of destroying the surface finish here. I just want to rub that back a little bit. No, that's actually working pretty well. Just to see if I can get rid of that pitting. I mean, I'm quite happy to play over the top of the pitted thing and it will have an antiqued sort of effect. Yeah, we might not actually be able to get rid of all of that rusting and pitting, but we can smooth it out a bit, I think. Yep, so that's the plan. Just gonna go all over this and get back to ideally a fairly clean metal surface. I will degrease it as well. Obviously we are introducing tiny, tiny scratches when we do this steel wool. So what I will do, I'll go over roughly like that first and then a much lighter rub over with the same steel wool, it's very fine steel wool, but we'll, once we've got all the corrosion off, I can rub it much more lightly and that will buff out some of those bigger scratches. So there we got a little bit of evidence that this was originally plated. So this wasn't a silver colored handle on a copper colored front plate. It was probably, all, it probably all looked brass when it was new. We can't get it back to that 
because I don't have the facilities to plate brass, but I can plate copper. I quite like copper as a colour, so we're going to go with that. So this seems to work quite well. Brasso in conjunction with steel wool. There are decades and decades of grime and corrosion and dirt and grease to work through here. So after I've done all of this, I'm going to degrease these parts and probably give them another light rub over before we try to plate them. All right, those are degrimed now. Interesting how much more copper is visible still on this internal door handle than the external door handle. Uh, we could probably infer something from that. Given that this is a toilet and washroom, perhaps the people coming out had cleaner hands than the people going in. That's encouraging, isn't it? Let's assume it's that. I think those are about as cleaned up as I can get them at the moment. So I'm going to just degrease them now and hopefully we'll get some of the more, some more of the grime off of them. So. It's the handles that need the most of it, I think. So we'll just give them a good spray of degreaser. Let that work for a bit. And this just rinses off. We've got these two door handles. They've been degreased and cleaned up as best I can. I'm gonna do a little bit more cleaning before we actually try and plate them. I've got some copper sulfate pentahydrate here. And I'll make a strong solution of that, as strong as I can. Might it actually take all of that. I've got some citric acid here, which we're going to use to kind of do a final clean and etch on these handles. It will just hopefully take any last little bits of corrosion off and slightly roughen the surface and make it take a new plating of copper. I've got a strip of copper here that was harvested from an old water tank, and so I'll clean that up as well. That's going to be my anode. The notion is we attach this to the negative so this becomes the cathode we put an anode in the plating bath copper comes out of solution basically copper ions come out of out of the solution and deposit on the metal fresh copper ions will come out of this piece of copper this will erode basically corrode into the solution replenishing those copper ions so we shouldn't have to top up the copper salts in the solution the copper anode should do that by itself i've been reading up a lot on what voltage to use and current to use and so on for this and it seems to be the case that a lower voltage is better that keeping it around one volt means I won't electrolyze the water and just split the water into hydrogen and oxygen but we'll actually do the kind of plating thing I don't have a bench power supply I'm going to use this little thing see if that works a little USB to well, a little USB buck boost controller with power terminals there. And you can control this from anywhere between 0 0.6 volts and I think 20 volts or something like that output. Obviously, current is limited because it's only USB, but I think at the lower voltages it can give up to 2 amps. So first off, I'm going to make a bit of citric acid solution. Oh, that's cheese salt. That's not that's not citric acid. That's <laughs> that's salt. Somewhere I've got citric acid, but that is not citric acid. That's from a cheese making kit. I haven't. I can't, I'm not going to put my hand on the citric acid. In which case, I will use vinegar instead. Back in a moment. Right. I thought we had white vinegar, but we don't. All I've got is malt vinegar. But that will be fine. That will still clean up this copper. But I think actually a change in the sequence of actions here because. I think I need to get my plating bath ready first before I etch this because I need to just etch this, rinse it straight in the plating bath. So, get some water. Despite the fact I have some chemistry equipment here, I am not a chemist. So don't expect to see stir bars and hot plates and whatnot. Or indeed, don't expect me to don't expect to see me measuring stuff. I'm just going to make a strong solution of copper sulfate. So I'll put that in there. A glass rod, again, would have been preferable, but we are where we are. So I'm using a coffee stirrer. Attaching the cathode wire to the handle was a bit of a challenge. I don't have any crocodile clips to hand. And so what I've actually done is made a spring out of the wire and jammed it down inside the handle, which I cleaned out. So something in there is making a contact. I can check that with a continuity tester, but I don't think I need to. 
So, and then I will use one of these little bulldog clips to attach the anode wire to this copper strip. So, a bit of vinegar on a paper towel. And I just put that on there. Would help if that was slightly abrasive as well. But you can just see the, the copper oxide coming away. I'll just give this surface here a little rub over and you can just see how much brighter that's gone. That that's untreated. That's treated. Because it's just taken off the oxide layer that was on there. This is the bit I'm really concerned about plating. This is the bit I'm really keen to actually get some copper onto the handle here. Right, that's given that just a little bit of a clean in that vinegar. I'm just going to rinse that off now. So it's going to hang in there that way up with these sticks through there like that. That's going to get it into the plating bath. That's going to be completely immersed. And then my copper anode can go in there like that and nothing's touching all looks good and there's room in there for me to stir things without getting in the way right i'll get this newspaper out of the way because it's kind of confounding the the picture here a little bit making it a bit harder to see what's going on unlike my beautiful tablecloth which makes everything very clear right that's my bath that's my plating bath and yeah i'm happy that nothing's touching anything else in there at least nothing that's not meant to be touching. My little USB widget has got plus and minus marked on it. I don't know if you're like me, I always have trouble remembering, or I always have to think a little bit about which is cathode and which is anode, positive and negative. And <laughs> the little bit of mental gymnastics I always have to go through in my head is cathode ray tube, the cathode rays come from the electron gun Electrons are negative, cathode is negative. I know that's stupid, but that's... It, it, I sometimes have trouble remembering things that are in pairs. Anyway, that's that. We will need to plug that in, but first let's see how we, get on with, how we got on with this copper sulfate. So that looks like it's all gone into solution. I could probably get some more in there, but that looks strong enough to me. And looking strong enough is where we're at really with this. So we'll get that on there first. Good, everything is under the liquid that should be under the liquid. Now we can plug things in. Now I should say, I'm gonna do this with adequate ventilation because this sort of process can devolve nasty things like hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide, those sort of nasties that will not be good for you. Right, I'm gonna make sure those aren't touching in there. and then plug it into one of those. 0 0.9 volts, seems about right. I'll go for one volt and away we go. Now I'm not expecting to see any bubbling or anything like that happening in here, but I will just give a little agitate just to make sure there's no bubbles on the surface and to make sure that there's a opportunity for copper ions to find their way to the metal. Well, interestingly, there are some loose little specks of copper floating around in there, which is... Well, actually, look at that. You can already see, gosh, copper building up quite significantly. I'm going to turn off the power here because we've got some work to do then. That happened a lot quicker than I thought it would. And it's a bit gummy and gungy there. I don't know what that is. That's just copper crystals have built up on the that's probably not exactly what I wanted but we have got a some build up of copper on the handle but at the moment it's a bit of a mess this is quite rough here and I think that's possibly what the problem is there's probably some ingrained dirt and corrosion in there that isn't going to come out quite so easily. Anyway, back in the bath for another little spin. That's definitely not touching. Okay, right, well I'll try and get you in so you can see what's actually going on when I plug it in. Right, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but look, when I 
clear away an area there, it almost immediately coats again with these dark coloured copper crystals, which is not what I want. I want a much thinner coat than that. So I think we're just going a bit too fast, but this is on the lowest voltage it'll go. And I've got no means of specifically reducing the current. Anyway, let's turn that off and have a look. Let's see what we got this time. So hopefully underneath here, no. So this is just building, there's, there's no adhesion of the copper here to the zinc surface. I may have to sand this or something to smooth it off. I think that's probably where we're going to have to go next. Everything else is kind of working. We are getting something like a plating of copper on here, or well, it's going to need a bit of buffing up. This actually looks worse than it did before I started. But a bit of brass, I will probably deal with that. But yeah, for the most part, we are getting copper deposited on there, but there's just a few spots where it's rough. And I think it's the roughness is just making the copper crystals grow in a powdery form, which is no use for me. So I'm going to give that a little sand with some just sandpaper and see if that makes a difference. So some very fine abrasive. I think this is 2000 grit. I'll just patch test this, I think, because that's how we'll know if it makes any difference. It's really weird. There's like a, it's almost like the degreasing hasn't got all of the. I wonder if there was a plastic coating or something on here, because it's almost like a gummy resinous material that's coming off, gumming up the sandpaper. Don't know. This might be the point where we decide that this project can't work. Yeah, it's very rough. It's very pitted there. Nevertheless, let's give that a little dip and see what we get. I don't think we need to go in for very long, actually. I'll just give that a little dunk and a swirl around. And something's happened. Or as they say, a change has taken place but it's not adhering. It's just growing copper crystals that then wipe off. The reason they look black is probably just because they are so fine. So I don't know. I think this might just be too pitted and worn to be plated at this stage. I may have to polish that down or I might have to cut my losses and declare this project not a complete success. I think there's a couple of things here. I need to be more thorough in sanding and polishing and smoothing this down and I think I probably need a power supply where I can really limit the current more than I can here. I can limit the voltage but I can't do anything about the current so I think there's probably just too much current flowing. It could be time to call it quits on this because that's always an option or we could do what you know people always do in this situation and declare that the desired product and say yes it's meant to be like that it's rustic so this was going to be a complete video but you're now seeing it as a random stuff segment because it's not a successful project i think i probably ran at this a bit too fast with the wrong equipment which is what i like to do anyway but yeah i don't think we're actually going to succeed here unless i can rub that down but that's zinc or mostly zinc and i don't know that that's going to be a good idea either. What's interesting is that there's copper accumulated on all sorts of other things where you know there's a bit of a copper plating on this tinned wire now and there was even some copper deposited on the insulation there so it's just like copper ions are just falling out of solution. Anyway yeah that did not go as desired but you know life's a bit like that sometimes. So yeah that's the one after cleaning that's the one after attempting to plate it definitely made it worse. There you go. Um, it was a brave effort. I'm sure all the people who know how to do this are yelling at me in the comments right now, but there it is. Interesting interference stuff going on there with the light, actually on the oxide layer. We've got a kind of rainbowy effect. But yeah, that was a fail. There we go. But, and I'm not even sure if we learned anything. Bridport, Bridport on market day, Saturday. Bridport has a fantastic market. We'll have a look at some of the stalls, but there is one thing in particular it's really useful here. 
Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah, all kinds of market stalls, but what we want is down here as an antiques market. Somewhere down here, we'll find a place that's got old hinges and door fittings and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Actually, I see a couple of handles at the back there. Oh. Jenny? They might fit. They look a bit small. It's solid brass though, that'll polish up. I've got the other one, so I'll, I'll offer it up and see. Just have, have a look around, see if there's anything else though. That's not quite what we're looking for. And the spacing between the the lock keyhole and the handle should be fairly standard. This is the same, yeah. It's the same world tour. See, I've got one of those already. Oh, you've got one of those? Yeah, but something I... like that. Yeah. Which is all right for, you know, brambles and stuff. I did see one back, back there, but it wasn't really... Yeah. Yeah, 
Thank you. Yeah, I reckon there's a polish up there. Yeah, they've got to be. That's, I've, I've checked with it. I've checked with thousands of different pairs. They're always exactly the same. Took the same. Yeah, the only bit that's different is the outline yeah, of the, 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 outside, yeah, the outside, isn't it? But the yeah. between the bone. So yeah, that's probably a slightly anticlimactic ending to that video segment. But there we go. That's the new old handle, the replacement we bought at Bridport Market. And it's gone on very nicely. And I decided, it, in fact, that we wouldn't even bother polishing it up because I quite like the patina that it already has on it. Of course, that's a brand new key because the lock is a brand new lock. So there we go. Anyway, Bridport Market might have another trip down there sometime on a slightly better day. It was raining when we went. So um, lots of interesting stuff there. But anyway, that's our replacement door handle. And I think the old one that was copper and zinc, I think will probably go to scrap. Today we find ourselves back at the Cern Abbas Giant, up there on Giant Hill. Not very well defined at the moment, actually looks like it could do with a top up of chalk. The Cern Abbas Giant is a chalk hill figure. I'll show you it on the information board here so you can get a better look and better idea of what that looks like. That's what he looks like. But yeah, not, not tremendously visible from down here. Now, last time we were here, we did go for a walk and we climbed up Giant Hill and from the, over there, you can't see the giant at all because the hill is so steep and you're standing below his feet. There is, however, I think, a better place to view the giant from and it actually involves walking away. So somewhere over there, there's a footpath that goes up a hill that's opposite the giant. And that's what we intend to try to find today. So yep, yeah, there is a footpath. There's the sign signing it, it goes up that hill. Now from the top of that hill is where I expect to find that we'll have a better view of the giant. And in fact, I think that might be the place where the giant was always meant to be viewed from when it was first constructed, I think that's what the builders had in mind, that it would be viewed from up on top of that hill. So the path, uh, the official path, I think goes straight across this field, but we couldn't see any trodden area of path. So we're gonna follow the edge of the field. Not that there's any crops here to trample at the moment, but uh, it's just, if you can't find the path, we'll follow the perimeter of the field and we should still find the style over there anyway. This field either had wheat or barley in it, which has just been harvested. And the farm vehicles over there collecting up the, the bales of straw. Well, we've hardly climbed a hill at all. And already from over here, we've got a far better view of the giant from just this slight uh, elevation just here. So we're now at the top corner of that field. Unfortunately, that hill I pointed out earlier, you can't quite get to the top of it without trespassing. There is a little deer track or something through here. And you can get up onto the lane here. But I feel vindicated in my assumption that this is the viewpoint for the giant. This is the best viewpoint for the giant. So here we are. There's the giant over there. A lot smaller, obviously, because we're further away. But this big hill, which I'll try and get you a view of, that big hill up there with the cows on it, those are also far away, is certainly the place where the giant was meant to be seen from. See the top of the hill just over there. But today, because we don't have permission to go on that bit of land, we will make do with this view from here, which is definitely a better view than you get from the viewpoint down there, the viewpoint and car park down there by the road. This is the actual official track that's the other side of the hedge. Obviously the giant is over there 
behind those trees, so we wouldn't have a very good view from there. But there's a stile here which indicates a footpath. The footpath carries on across there, and there's a thing that says strictly no access to hill. That would be the best view up there. But the sign says strictly no access, so we're going to follow that instruction. So you can either cross the road directly at the car park and go up through a footpath that's through the field that's marked, or you can follow this permissive footpath along here to a gate that will take you up another footpath track, which is where we went. But yeah, I'm very certain that that giant was meant to be viewed from the opposite hill. So we've come for a little wander today into Weymouth from Bowley's Cove, and I thought I'd just show you what an English seaside town looks like. Weymouth being a particularly good example of that. The first thing to say is Weymouth is a sandy beach. The main pleasure beach here at Weymouth is fine sand, fine yellow sand. So if you want to make sand castles, this is where to go. I do get people making surprise comments about stony beaches in the UK being different from sandy beaches elsewhere in the world. We do have sandy beaches, it's just I never go to them. So architecture in a place like this is always really interesting. Always a real mixture of very ornate and quite often quite colourful buildings. So, don't know what this must have been. Looks like maybe a bank or something. And then we've got an old sign up there for a restaurant that's no longer here, Harding's Dorothy Restaurant. So despite the weather being a little bit patchy cloud and sunshine today, everyone's out on the beach making sandcastles. No dogs on this beach. So they're all here having fun on their summer holidays. It is the school holidays at the moment. We're actually parked all the way over there in Bowley's Cove on top of the hill. So on the way back to the car, we'll have a look at some of the kind of sights of Weymouth seafront and this largely Victorian seaside town. So here's a lovely example of a covered seating shelter so you can get your fish and chips and sit under this ornate victorian sheltered seating if it's raining you can still by the, be by the seaside traditional fish and chips being the menu of choice in a place like this traditional punch and judy show So, I mean, this is why I don't often come to sandy beaches. It's not that I dislike humans, but there are quite a lot of them here. So, this is the Royal Hotel over here. Lovely old building. So this very Victorian looking clock up here, this little clock tower standing on the seafront. I say very Victorian because this was built to commemorate the Jubilee of Queen Victoria, I believe. Billy. <laughs>
this? So this perhaps peculiar building here, sticking out into the sea, is what remains of the pier. I believe there used to be a pier extending from that cream coloured building out into the bay. And there probably would have been either amusements or perhaps a theatre at the end of it. And all that's left now is that building, which is the start of the pier. Yay, Doppler effect. So up at this end of the bay, it's a little bit more, it turns into shingle and less sand, although there is sand down at the tide line. Tide is in at the moment. And you can hire a pedalo to go out on the bay. This is one of the variations of beach huts we've seen here today. So these are kind of semi-open little beach huts. People can rent these, I presume, or rent them for a period of time and then use them for shelter when they're doing their seaside stuff. And here we've got what would have been, I think, probably one great big hotel at one point, the Hotel Prince Regent. But there's, it's now several hotels and different complexes of buildings. Hotel Prince Regent. So this is here bandstand. I think what we'll do, we'll just have a wander down here. I just want to wander down and see the back of this building and see if there's any evidence of the remains of the pier. Well, yeah, that's where it would have been. Can't see any, can't see anything left of it in the water. But the pier would have extended out here. And as we head along here, this is the promenade, which will take us all the way back around to Bowley's Coast. We're going to see a variety of different beach huts. So yeah, typically these sorts of beach huts, they've all got a little chain on to stop people going in and all different padlocks. So I think people rent these for a period of time, maybe annually, and then they use them just for shelter. I suppose it's, you know, if you come here and it's raining, which can happen, you can still sit and watch the waves. And then down here, you've got an even more basic version of the same, which is almost just like a, a, a shelter, just to keep the rain off and sit under. But there are some also quite upmarket beach huts here, which we'll have a look at. So I think they must be about as down market as beach huts get. And so you get a little locker, presumably they've got their beach balls and buckets and spades and whatnot in the little locker. And then you've got a place to sit and a fold out table or something and a roof to keep the rain off your head. So here we've got a kind of municipal seaside garden with a planted area commemorating the coronation. Charles III. So those are the kind of down market beach huts and obviously somebody's put some sides on that one when they're here to make it a little bit more of a shelter. But here's some kind of slightly posher ones. So built as a little terrace, these beach huts are all numbered and people would rent one of these annually. 
don't know how expensive they are. In some places I think these can be quite reasonable. And if you've got kids and you want to come and make sandcastles every day of the summer holidays, I suppose that's a good place to make a little base, make a cup of tea. And then along here we've got a terrace of, well these aren't really beach huts, these are more like beach chalets. They're built as a terrace, they're brick and stone and cast iron. And presumably Victorian construction, they look like it, certainly from the iron work. We'll have a closer look in a moment. Lifeguard station. So yeah, these little things, they're, they're not very big. They're just about the size of a garden shed really, but enough space inside for somebody to set up a little kitchen, perhaps. You know, make a bacon sandwich, yeah. boil a kettle. Yeah. Make a few sandwiches or something. And up on top, I think there's a restaurant or, again, this sort of sea promenade type of thing that would have been very popular in Victorian times sitting here with all of these windows open probably enjoying the sea air but without getting your feet wet so i had a little peep inside one of these here's one actually where there's nobody in and we can have a peep through the window so there's a little kitchen in there there's mains power microwave fridge some some of them have got a little uh, cooktop not a lot of space in there but enough just to do your lunches and sit out of the sunshine maybe and then here we've got some different kind of beach hut, chalet type of things. A little complex of them. And so, all built as little blocks, little terraces of chalets. And again, must be holiday lets or, or people rent them annually. And you've got a safe sand pit here for the kids and a little paddling pool. And an enclosed area so they can't run off. I can see the appeal. So I've noticed something interesting about this beach, which I don't know if you can probably, you can probably see it down here. There is this scalloped, consistent wave effect all the way along here. As you walk along the beach, you're walking up a little bit of shingle, then down into a sandy bit and so on. It's very regular, very consistent. Now, my question is, are we looking at an interference pattern here? Are we looking at two sets of waves coming in from maybe over there and over there? and interfering as they break on the shore and causing a bit where there's a bit more wave coming in and a bit less wave coming in. So is that an interference pattern? We'll have a look at a clearer example of that in a moment. So here we go, notice the very very regular wavy pattern carved out of this beach here. But yeah, are we looking at an interference pattern caused by two different wave fronts coming in from over there, somewhere out to sea, and interfering when they hit the shore here? I'll draw a little diagram of what I mean by that. So if this had been one of those videos where I'm uh, on a budget and I'm looking for something to add flavour, there's rosemary. That's for remembrance. So, a little bit of that. Oh, it smells wonderful. So yeah. I'm sure it would be perfectly acceptable to pick a little sprig of that and use it in cooking. Not today though. So while we're here at Bowley's Cove, couldn't really not come and have a look at Jordan Hill Roman Temple. That's what's left of a Roman temple. And then across the hill, over the way there, is the Osmington Horse. The white horse at Osmington. More of a beige horse, really. So, that was our walk from Weymouth. That's where our journey started, way away over there. All the way round to Bowley's Cove. Back to where we're parked, just here. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.